out here at in Lemal Bay at low tide and I painted this the other day in the most extreme condition it was a really really windy day really beautiful but I had to deal with that wind and that's what I'm going to show you how I managed to put this down put down the fastest strokes and get in as much as I can in that high wind because that's really what you know on the road and travel sketching is about it's really about dealing with any day so I, I really wanted to paint this and it was a beautiful day there were people walking out on those flats and despite the wind my hat blew off I had to hang on to my easel because it was about to tip over but I did it anyway because it was so beautiful and um, that's really you know what this part of this segment is about it's about dealing with how you deal with that how do you how do you deal with unexpected things like wind and La Malbay is so beautiful it's got these big extremes of high tide and low tide and La Malbay in French means bad bay and it was named bad bay because when the, the first explorers to Quebec like Samuel de Champlain about 1600 came through here he couldn't dock his ship here because uh, the tides were so low and it would ground the ships. So La Mal Bay, the bad bay. Um, and I'm going to paint that here, show you how I do that in the wind. When I'm sketching in extreme conditions, like in this high wind, I want to get the main shapes down quickly. In this scene, there are two main areas, sky and beach. There's also a bit of river that we can see in the distance and the far off peninsula that juts out into the water. At the same time, I want to make sure that I draw in the horizon line early on so I can separate my sky and water washes. When I'm painting clouds, I often pencil in a few shapes. That way, when I add watercolor, I'll be able to paint around the areas I want to leave white. In the distance, I can see a few houses and the steeple of a church, but the trees form one solid shape. At low tide, the beach is full of debris but I won't draw all of it because I want to leave some space to create some of that texture with my brush. I'll definitely add in some people to provide scale and to also give a sense of life to the scene. After all, what would a beach scene be without people enjoying it all? I usually start with a torso, add a head and arms and legs. From this distance, you don't really actually see the facial fe features, so I don't worry too much about those. I often start the painting process by painting the sky. I wet most of the top of the page with clear water, but I sometimes leave a few dry areas for the tops of the clouds. I want to make sure those remain really white. Diluted yellow ochre or raw sienna adds some warmth and depth to the sky. The blue I use is a mix of cerulean and cobalt, and to that I add cobalt violet or even lavender for the undersides of the clouds. On a windy day like this, the paper dries so quickly, so you have to manage the amount of water on your brush. My first wash of blue is quite wet, but if I go back in with more pigment, I try not to dip my brush in the water because I don't want to get backgrounds in the clouds. After the sky, the next area I want to paint is the beach. There are so many colors in that wet sand warms and cools and reflections. 
I still have some blue on my palette, so to that I add burnt sienna and burnt umber to make a warm tone that's not too dark. I want to leave some places for dark rocks later. I also want lots of movement on the beach to create a sense of dynamism and flow. In these juicy washes, I alternate between warm grey and some bluer areas where the tide is starting to come in. I also try to let those areas blend right on the paper. My round brush holds a lot of water, so I can cover quite a bit of the sketch with it. As I move to the foreground of the sketch, I let my brush dry out a little. That way, I can create some texture by just moving it horizontally over the cold press paper. That little bit of the St. Lawrence estuary that I can see in the distance is a darker blue, so I'll add some Prussian blue to the mix and hopefully paint the water with a steady hand. I'll add some Azo Yellow and Quinacridone Gold to the blue puddle on the palette so I can paint the distant trees. But as I move from left to right, you can see I'll shift the color slightly from warmer to cooler. My brush has to travel carefully around the houses because I know I'll want to add a little bit of color on those later. Burnt Sienna is what I often use for flesh tones. I paint those first and let them dry before painting the clothing of my beach walkers. As I move from the bigger areas to the smaller ones, I work with a drier brush. If your brush has a good point to it, you can use the same one for big washes as well as small details. Turquoise blue and cadmium red work so well together that I often use them for painting people in urban scenes, and I think they would work well here too. Even though the washes I used on the beach were really wet, they're dry enough now for me to paint the rocks and reflections on the sand. I try to limit my colors in a scene like this, first of all to create a sense of harmony, but also because it's more efficient when you're trying to paint quickly. That's why I return to burnt umber and blue for the darkest colors and the details. And since I've been using mostly Prussian blue and burnt umber in the sketch, I continue with that for the rocks, but much less diluted than when I painted the sand.
Usually I have a hard time knowing when to finish a sketch, but I can keep on painting details for a long time. But in challenging conditions like this, once the essential strokes and colors are down, it'll be a relief to pack up and get out of the wind. That's when I call it a day.